our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much again for this time. We bow our head before your presence at this time, and we are earnestly praying to you that you may be with us and each one of us in this room, and open our hearts and teach your word. Father, please help us to understand what kind of man we ought to be before you. The world around us is getting more and more dangerous, and so many things are happening, and they are giving us a great fear. At this time, we are looking for the true peace in our life. Where is the peace, and what is the true peace? Please give us your truth and your knowledge and your peace in our hearts. Please take us from the darkness into your marvelous light and take us from the power of sin into the everlasting blessing of Jesus Christ. Please save all of us and each one of us in this room that we may glorify your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And our first scripture passage is found in the book of Isaiah, chapter 43. Our first scripture passage is found in Isaiah 43, verse 1. Let me read out loud from verse 1. But now thus says the Lord, who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you, I have called you by your name. You are mine. Verse 10. You are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, nor shall there be after me. Let me give you one more passage in the book of Acts, New Testament Bible. Book of Acts. You may put your bookmark on Isaiah 43. And let me give you one more passage as the beginning passage of today. In the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 3. I am going to read, and you may listen. To whom Jesus, he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. The Bible has all the answers, you know, and it has all different kinds of Proofs, And those proofs are many and infallible. Many infallible proofs. So many people around us, they are very, very, very skeptical about the Bible because of their ignorance. That's what I believe. People, they are ignorant of the word. They are trying to deny the Bible. They are trying to not to believe it. But many of them, they have not read the Bible from the beginning to the end. They don't know what is in the Bible, but they are just trying to deny the Bible. What an absurdity it is. And I can tell you again and again that the Bible is the Word of God. 100% and 100% inspired, given by the Lord. And it has infallible proofs and many proofs. There are so many proofs and evidences of God's existence in his creation and in the history of mankind that God is ruling. And here we are going to study again about the history of Israel nation. The nation Israel, they are the best evidence among all the evidences of God's existence. Yesterday, we, we learned
what about the past history of the, the nation Israel? What happened to them? And why all these things happened to them? Tonight, we are going to learn what is going to be happening in their future history, and we are going to learn about them. The Bible is full of prophecies. Prophecies are the history of God written in advance. He foretold and he wrote in advance. And then as time goes on, all of them, they are being fulfilled. Many of them, they have been fulfilled already. And they are to be fulfilled in the future. So if you compare the actual human history of the mankind with the literal word of God, then you will come to the final conclusion that this Bible is truly, truly word of God. This is not the man-made book. It is written by man, but it is spoken by the Lord. There are many, many evidences, and they are infallible, infallible proof. And among them, the nation Israel, they are in the core of all the evidences of God's existence and his divine ruling in the human history. God is invisible. His wisdom is invisible. But he is alive. Because he is alive, he rules in the history of the mankind. Let me give you a very, very simple analogy. And I am writing something with this pen. And let me give you a question. Am I writing or is pen writing? Silly question. Yes. Yes, I am writing. I'm the one who is writing something with this pen. But in some sense, we can say that the pen is writing something. But here's one more thing that we should remember. The pen cannot write anything by itself because I am holding this pen. It is being controlled by my hand. Likewise, the relationship, it, the relationship between the nation Israel and God is like this. The pen here can be compared to the image of the nation Israel. And the hand which is holding this pen is the one of God. Look at the history of mankind. Search them very carefully and compare them with the written word of God. Read the word of God and then look at the history of mankind. Then we will understand that somebody is holding the nation of Israel behind them. He is not only holding the nation of Israel, but also holding whole world. He is the master of the history, and he is the ruler and governor of the history of mankind. And the history of Israel, the nation Israel, is a good example which tells us how God is dealing with the history of mankind. We have past history of Israel and present and future history of the nation Israel. We all remember that they were chosen people of God, but they were scattered, dispersed, and persecuted everywhere in the world. God himself, he dispersed them and scattered them throughout the world, even though they were chosen people of God. That does not necessarily mean that God did not love them. The Bible tells us that God still loves his nation. He loves his chosen people. And he wants to show his mercy to the nation Israel. And he is doing that. Today, God is bringing all Israeli people from many corners of the world into their homeland. If God forgot his nation, why would he do that? He wouldn't, and he didn't. He does still love his people and his nation. Today, so many Jews around the world, they are returning to their homeland as the Bible foretold long, long time ago. Tonight, we are going to learn how Israeli people are returning to their homeland. 
and why they are returning to their homeland. And what does it mean to us? Why is that so important to us? Why should we learn about the history of Israel? Restoration of nation Israel. They were destroyed, the people were dispersed, scattered, but now they are returning to their homeland. In 1948, May 14, the nation Israel became independent country. This is the picture of the first Israeli prim, uh, Prime Minister, Ben Gurion, who was declaring the independence of Jewish nation. Since the time, so many Jews, they return to the land of Israel from Western Europe, Middle Eastern countries, Northern Africa, and from here, from North America and South America. So many Jews, they want to go back to their home country. They will, they will. So many young people and old people from all around the world, they gather together under Davis flag, their homeland, the promised land that was given to their forefather Abraham. Nation. When the people returned to their homeland first, the land was barren and devast devastated. Therefore, they started to cultivate the land. Look at this. And they set up greenhouses and turned the wilderness into the fertile land, and putting pipeline and drawing water from the northern area from the Lake of Galilee. If you go to Israel, you will find out that the climate, the climate and the temperature and all the weather pattern in, in the land of Israel are very similar to the one of California or Nevada. Very dry, no rain all year, but some rain during the winter time. From November, late November, until late February. Winter season, rainy season, but not much of rain. Very dry. So this is what they do. They use the pipeline from the northern Galilee, drawing water, and they are watering the whole land with the sprinkler system. And this is how they could build this kind of huge modern city like Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv is one of the most beautiful Mediterranean city in Israel. People there, they are speaking many different languages because they came from different parts of the world. In Israel, three different languages are publicly being used in television, English, French, and Hebrew. Why? Why so many languages in one country? That is a clear sign that the people, they had come from many countries. They are building new houses, modern cities, and they are enjoying free time. Cultivating the barren land into beautiful land by using sprinkler system. Looks like a scenery of California, but this is Israel. You will see the contrast between the, the barren mountain and the beautiful residential area. Israel has become one of the most famous farming countries in the world. They are exporting flowers to whole land, Netherlands. They are producing all different kinds of tropical fruits. The barren land, it has become beautiful land. What is going on in the land of Israel? Something is going on. This is a clear sign that God still loves his nation. He still loves his people and he loves his land. 
Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 8 through 11. Because time is limited, I have uploaded so many scripture passages here. But you, O mountains of Israel, you shall shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit to my people Israel, for they are about to come. For indeed I am for you, and I will turn to you, and you shall be tilled and sown. I will multiply men upon you. And all the house of Israel, all of it, and the cities shall be inhabited, and the ruins rebuilt. I will multiply upon you men and beast, and they shall increase and bear young. I will make you inhabited as in former times, and do better for you, listen carefully, do better for you than at your beginning. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I believe that it was pretty easy for us to understand what it means. This is foretelling what God is going to do in the future. About 2,600 years ago from today, the prophet Ezekiel received the word of God and he was foretelling what would be happening way in the future. Today. Today. When God restores his nation. You shall know that I am the Lord. That is the final conclusion. When God brings his people back to their homeland, when he changes land from the wilderness into a fertile land, then the people will know, they will understand that Jehovah is the Lord. He is the only God. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 19, 21. So I scattered them among the nations. They were dispersed throughout the country. I judged them according to their ways and their deeds. When they came to the nation, wherever they went, they profaned my holy name. When they said, to, said of them, these are the people of the Lord, yet they have gone out of his land. People, they were mocking Jewish people. When they had been scattered throughout the world. So many Jews, they were persecuted by Gentiles. They were giggled by the Gentiles. They were mocked by them. These are the people of the Lord, and yet they have gone out of their land. And how can they claim to be chosen people of God? That's what many people say. Verse 21. Very important verse is found here. But God says, I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations wherever they went. God himself, he had concern for his name. Because the name had been profaned by the people of Israel. Therefore, God decided to restore his nation, to bring his people back to their homeland, and to change the barren land into the beautiful land, like the Garden of Eden. Chapter 36, verse 33. Thus says the Lord God, on the day that I cleanse you from all your iniquities, I will also enable you to dwell in the cities, and the ruins shall be rebuilt. The desolate land shall be tilled instead of lying desolate in the sight of all who pass by. So they will say, this land that was desolate has become like the Garden of Eden, and the wasted, desolate, and ruined cities are now fortified and inhabited. Then the nation which are left all around you shall know that I, the Lord, have rebuilt the ruined places and planted what was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken it, and I will do it. I, the Lord, have spoken it, and I will do it. And now today, he did it. He spoke, and he did it. Yes, this is what we see today. 
Israel yesterday and today. Gestern and heute. The upper picture, it shows us the previous image of the land of Israel, the old image, and the lower pictures, they are showing us today's picture. Yesterday and today. It gives us the contrast of the old land and the new land. The same place has been changed into beautiful land. People, they have built all the buildings. They have built new cities, cultivated the land. This is what is happening in Israel. He has spoken it, and he did it. Yes, beautiful. This is a beautiful picture of kibbutz of Israel. Israel has become one of the most famous and powerful farming countries. And they are exporting fruits and flour to the Europe. And people, they are gathering from every corner of the world, from east, west, north, and south. Everywhere. Isaiah chapter 43. If you go to the book of Isaiah 43. Verse 1. Book of Isaiah, chapter 43, verse 1. But now thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel. Verse 5. Let's go to verse 5. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your descendants from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not keep them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the end of the earth. Yes, at the time of prophet Isaiah, God foretold that he would bring Israeli people back to their homeland from every corner of the world, from the east, from the west, from the north, and from the south. But interesting, a very interesting expression is here. He says to the north, give them up. And he says to the south, do not hold them back. Let them go. He doesn't say anything to the east, to the west, but he speaks something to the north and to the south. You may find some differences. It explains us what will be happening in the future. Yes. When Israeli people return to their homeland, they have no problem to return to their homeland from the east and from the west of Israel. If you go eastward, Asia, westward, crossing over Mediterranean Sea, and you will reach to North America and South America. But if you go far north, former Russia, Soviet Union, communist country, they persecuted the Jews so harshly. It is known that there were about 3.2 million Jews in Russia, and many of them, they could not return, return freely to their home country because of communist country, Russia. And if you go south, North East of Africa, Sudan, and Ethiopia. Many Jews, they had lived there for a long time, thousand years. They became black Jews. But they could not return to, to the land of Israel because they were in poverty and they were in very bad condition. 
But what happened later? In 1948, a number of Arab Jews, they returned to the land of Israel from many different Middle East countries. And even from Africa, Ethiopian Jews. Operation Solomon, in 1991, there was a civil war in Ethiopia between the government and the people. And Israeli government, they decided to, to bring all the Jews from the land of Israel, uh, Ethiopia. And they dispatched some cargo plane by the help of the Air France, and they transported 18,000 Jews from Ethiopia to Israel. And this picture, it shows us the image of Ethiopian Jewish boy and American Caucasian Jewish boy. They are hugging each other, showing that they are brothers, Jews. One reporter of Reuters news agency went to Ethiopia and, and studied and, and examined very carefully the lifestyle of the Ethiopian Jews. Many of them, they were keeping Sabbath on Saturday. They were reading Torah in Jewish synagogue, and they were commemorating all different kinds of Jewish festival, Passover, Rosh Hashanah, and something like that. Who were they? Jews. And they returned to Israel in 1991 even from the south. Ethiopia and Sudan, and even from far north. This is what is happening today. In Isaiah chapter 60, verse 8, God says, Who are these who fly like a cloud and like doves to their roost? God is foretelling, and he was foretelling, that the people of Israel would be returning to their homeland. Who are these who fly like a cloud and like dove to their roost? Doves, they have a great ability to fly far away and then exactly return to their nest. Wherever they fly out, then they know how to return to their nest. Israeli people, in some sense, they are like the doves. They were scattered all around the world. They lost their nest, the promised land. They were dispersed into many, many different directions. But as the dove returned to the nest, all the Jews that had been scattered throughout the world, they returned to their nest, to the promised land. What a wonderful and great prophecy it is. Who are these who fly like a cloud and like doves to their roost? Yes, God is bringing them back to their homeland like doves. But now, thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob. Jacob was the name of Israel. And he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. Israeli people, they had lived in fear for a long time. But now, they don't have any reason to fear God because God is with them. God is not against them, but he is for them and with them. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your descendants from the east, from the, from the west, from all different kind of corners of the world. Then he says, why don't you read and understand the context of these passages. Chapter, one, uh, chapter 43, verse 1, he says, and he calls the name of Israel. Verse 5, 6, he says that he is going to bring his people back to their homeland. And then, in verse 10, let us read together. God says, and he speaks to his people. You are my witnesses, says the Lord and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me, there was no God formed, 
nor shall there be after me. Very important passage. Probably this is the most important passage of tonight. Bible study. God calls the nation Israel as his witnesses. You are my witnesses. God speaks to Jacob, to the nation Israel, to the people of Israel. And he calls them as his witnesses. What is the meaning of that? They were scattered, dispersed, but God is going to bring all people back to their homeland. And he is doing that. Bringing all people from the east, from the west, from the north, from the south. Then he says, Israel, you are my witnesses. The fact that the people are returning to the homeland is the clear sign that God of Israel is not dead, but alive. He is a living God. Look at the nation Israel and understand who is holding the nation Israel. Then you will understand that God is holding their nation. He himself, he dispersed his people into the world and now, he himself, he is bringing them back to their homeland. Yes, he is doing that. Amos chapter 9, verse 14 and 15. I will bring back the captive of my people Israel, and they shall build the waste cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink wine from them. They also make gardens and eat fruit from them. I will plant them in their land, and no longer, no longer shall they be pulled up from the land I have given them. Yes, prophet Amos foretold it. God brings the captives back to their homeland. And they are building new cities, making gardens and producing fruits. And what a beautiful land they have made. The prophecies... The prophecies in the Bible foretold thousands of years ago have been exactly fulfilled in our generation. Then how can we deny that this Bible is truly, truly word of God? If you go to Israel, you may visit this interesting place, that sea. If you cannot swim, don't worry about it. Jump into the water and you will be floated because the water is too salty. Interesting place. And it attracts a lot of tourists from all around the world. And they are getting a lot of income. Israel has become a wealthy country. And more than that, today they are cultivating the Dead Sea water, and they are producing all different kinds of minerals and chemicals. And the value of it is more than the whole wealth of the United States. Someone says that the value of the Dead Sea is much more than the combined wealth of France, United States, and Japan. I don't know exactly. But anyway, so valuable. Today, Israel, they are getting oil from the Mediterranean Sea. And they have becoming, and they have become oil producing country and natural gas producing country. They have become so wealthy country. If you Google it, you will get all information about it. The sea, Mediterranean Sea, is giving them great blessing. Oil production. Isaiah chapter 60, verse 5. Here is a very interesting prophecy. God says, Then you shall see and become radiant, and your heart shall swell with joy. 
because the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you and the wealth of the Gentiles shall come to you. God says, the abundance of the sea will be given to you and the wealth of the Gentile nations will come to you. What an interesting prophecy it is and a great prophecy it is and it is exactly fulfilled. The abundance of the sea. Israel, they have two different seas. That sea and Mediterranean Sea. From both of them, they are getting wealth. Yes, they have become wealthy country. The abundance of the sea is turning to them. Isaiah chapter 30, first, verse 35. Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for light by day, the ordinances of the moon and the stars for a night, uh, for light by night, who disturb the sea and its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from before me, says the Lord, then the seed of Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus says the Lord, if heaven above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched up beneath, I will also cast up all the seed of Israel for all that they have done, says the Lord. This prophecy is the swear of God. God himself, he is swearing that he is not going to abandon his country. He will remember his country and his people because he has a special love for his nation. As the parents, they have special love for their children. God, he has special love for the nation Israel. And this is the reason why they are returning to their homeland. And this is the reason why God is restoring the land. Then, here's the question. So what? Jewish people are returning to their homeland and the land is becoming beautiful garden. So what? What does it mean to me? What is the meaning of that? Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24. Now along this parable from the fig tree, when its branch has already become tender and put forth leaf, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the door. The restoration of the nation Israel is an alarming clock which tells us that the second coming of Jesus is very, very near and he is at the door, which means that he's knocking at the door. He is very, very close to us. But it is so sad that so many people around us, they are still sleeping. God is giving us a wake-up call. Wake up. God is coming. Jesus is coming soon and very soon. But so many people, they are still spiritually dull. And they are sleeping. No sense at all. People don't care. So what? This is so important matter. So serious. It is related to you. Jesus is coming soon and very soon. Learn this parable from the fig tree. There are some trees which are being used, which are used as the emblem for the nation Israel. Olive tree is one of them, and here is fig tree. Fig tree, it symbolized the nation Israel. When the people of Israel were scattered throughout the whole world, the fig tree Israel became withered, dried fig tree. We can say like that. 
And now this dried, withered fig tree is becoming tender and shooting forth leaves. What is going on? The tree is not dead. Suppose that you have a beautiful apple tree in your backyard, okay? Huge apple tree in your backyard, and no fruit at all, no leaves at all for a hundred years. And a lot of people assume that the tree has already died. It is a dead tree. People assume. But hundred years later, year 2015, summer, the, the old tree, which has been dead, regarded as dead for hundred years, is shooting forth leaves, and now apple on the tree. Is the tree dead or not? No, the tree is alive. The nation Israel is like that. The fig tree, the nation Israel, they have became, they have become almost dead for 2,000 years. Scattered all around the world, persecuted for 2,000 years. No land, no country. And all people around the world, they thought that the people of Israel, they were abandoned by God. And many of them, they thought that there was no God. But 2,000 years later, right now in our generation, the fig tree who has been dead for 2,000 years, shooting forth its leaves and becoming tender. What does it mean? The tree is not dead. The tree is alive. God is with them. The fact that Israeli people are returning to their homeland is so important to us because that is the first sign of the end times. The Bible tells us that there will be many signs at the end times. How do we know that the second coming of Jesus is so near? Because there will be signs before the coming of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 24, on Mount Olive, some disciples of Jesus, they asked Jesus. Now, as Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately and asked him, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Very interesting question. Even the disciples of Jesus, they wanted to know what would be the signs of the end time. And Jesus gave them answers to their question. Matthew chapter 24. Let's go to Matthew chapter 24. Verse 3. Gospel of Matthew chapter 3 through 8 and 14. Very important verse. Gospel of Matthew chapter 24 verse 3. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him and saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Verse 4, and Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear wars and rumors of wars, and see that you are not troubled. For all these things must come to pass but the end is not yet. Verse 7, For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famine, pestilence, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrow. Verse 14, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world 
as a witness to all the nation. And then the end will come. Yes, about the signs of the end times, Jesus mentioned. Very interesting question. Even today, a lot of people around us, they are wondering whether we are truly living at the end time. Yes, we are. This is what I believe. This is what many Christians believe in common. Many Bible teachers and evangelical Bible Bible teachers and theologians, and so many pastors, they commonly believe that the second coming of Jesus will take place in our generation. This is what the scripture tells us. Jesus is coming soon and very soon. And how do we know that? There will be and there should be some signs of the second coming of Jesus. Number one, let me remind you what Jesus mentioned and stated, and then we will have break time and then come back. Number one, Jesus, he mentioned about so many things, and before that, we all remember that the first sign of the second coming of Jesus is the returning of the Jews. This is what we have learned so far. Return of the Jews. The parable of the fig tree, Jesus mentioned. When the nation Israel, the fig tree is becoming tender and shooting forth leaves, then we know that the summer is near. Likewise, when we see all these things, when we see that the nation is being recovered, then we know that he is coming soon and very soon, knocking at the door. Number one, the return of the Jews. Number two, Global problem, environmental problem. I'm going to mention later about this. And here in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus mentioned about spiritual deception. A lot of people will come in Jesus' name and they will claim to be Jesus, even though they are not. They are false prophets. Spiritual deception will take place. But a lot of people, they will be misled by them, and they will follow them. Many false teachers will, will appear, and many people will follow them. Wars and rumors of war. There will be political turmoil and famine. There will be famine everywhere. And earthquakes in various places and pestilences in everywhere. And finally, the gospel of Christ will be preached throughout the world. These are the main signs of the end times. And the return of the Jew is the number one. Let us take 10 minute break and then we'll come back. Yes, let us continue. Jesus mentioned about the signs of the end times and many other Bible passages are telling us many different, different signs that will take place at the end time. Let me remind you one more time, the return of the Jews, global environmental problem, spiritual deception, wars and rumors of war and famine, earthquakes, pestilences, and worldwide preaching of the gospel. These are the major signs that will take place at the end times. Environmental problems. What is the common sign of aging? When we get old, we, we do have all different kinds of problems. Back pain, neck pain, waist pain, diabetes, okay? All different kinds of problems. If you have old car, you have transmission problem, engine problem, leaking problem, every different kind of problem. If you have an old house, plumbing problem, roofing problem, all different kinds of problem. The earth is getting old. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 11 foretold 1,900 years old. 
year, years ago. The heavens and the earth, they will perish, but you remain. They will all grow old like a garment. Like a cloak, you will fold them up, and they will be changed. The heaven and the earth, they will grow old like old garments. Today, the major problem is global warming. That is the major environmental problem. The temperature is going up, and the iceberg in North Pole and South Polar region getting melt. Polar bear, nowhere to go. They are standing not on the iceberg, but on Santa Claus. Penguin, what is going on? Save the climate. People try to, but very pessimistic. Endangered Earth. Global warming. Stop it. But how can we stop it? Every year, we are losing 25,000 up to 50,000 species. They are becoming extinct because of global warming, climatic change. Ices are getting melt. And this small town in Alaska will be disappearing pretty soon because the sea level is going up. Yes, again. Or see the contrast of natural beauty. It's previous condition and present condition. Beautiful coral reef. Many of them have become like this. Big problem, this beautiful coral reef became like this. This beautiful Danube riverbed in Poland or Austria somewhere became like this. Les Alpes, like this. Something is going on. Global warming. We are getting hit. The temperature is reaching us. Listen to this. This is Mount Kilimanjaro more than 30 years ago and more recently. And a friend of mine just came back from Kilimanjaro with a picture he took a couple months ago. Another friend, Lonnie Thompson, studies glaciers. Here's Lonnie with a last sliver of one of the once mighty glaciers. Within the decade, there will be no more snows of Kilimanjaro. This is happening in Glacier National Park. I climbed to the top of this in 1998 with one of my daughters. Within 15 years, this will be the park formerly known as Glacier. Here is what's been happening year by year to the Columbia Glacier. It just retreats every single year. And it's a shame because these glaciers are so beautiful, but those who go up to see them Here's what they're seeing every day now. In the Himalayas, uh, there's a particular problem because 40% of all the people in the world get their drinking water from rivers and spring systems that are fed more than half by the meltwater coming off the glaciers and within this next half century, those 40% uh, of the people on Earth are going to face a very serious shortage because uh, of this melting. Italy, the Italian Alps, same sight today. An old postcard from Switzerland throughout the Alps was seeing the same story. It's also true in uh, South America. This is Peru 15 years ago and the same glacier today. This is Argentina 20 years ago, same glacier today. 
75 years ago in Patagonia on the tip of South America, this vast expanse of ice is mm. now gone. There is a message in this. It is worldwide. It is worldwide. The heavens and the earth, they are becoming like an old garment. Time to be changed, but it's too late. Can we save the planet? The Bible tells us that there will be and that famines. One of the biggest problems in America is obesity. But in many different countries, famine is pretty, pretty common. Many countries in Africa, famine. A lot of people, they are dying because of shortage of food. In every seven seconds, one child is dying in Africa because of shortage of food. Big problem. Famine then everywhere. Hunger belt is becoming larger and larger. There will be famine and earthquake in various places, Jesus said. Earthquake movement are becoming stronger and stronger and frequent. We all remember the power of Indonesian earthquake pretty recently. That was the beginning of many of us. Major earthquakes in decade, we remember. Very recently, Indonesian tsunami. The earthquake hit the sea, hit the sea and it was 9.1, 9.3 in the Wichita scale. The death toll was about 100,000 up to 250, 225,000, with over 7 billion worth of rescue and damage code. Sichuan, China, Wichita scale 8.0. In Japan, in 2011, March 11, 9.3, 9.03 in magnitude, very strong earthquake, about 15,878 people die, becoming powerful and powerful and becoming frequent. In Chile, South America, and very near to Florida, Port-au-Prince in Haiti, 7.0, 316,000 dead, 300,000 injured, and 1 million people homeless. And a couple of days ago in Nepal, historic earthquake in Nepal in 100 years, April 25th, 2015. Very strong earthquake, almost 5,000 people, they are believed to be killed. Indonesian earthquake. The whole town was devastated. This Korean newspaper reports that the island of Sumatra got drifted away 36 meters. Even the whole island got drifted away 36 meters. In the book of Revelation, there is a passage says, which says that there will be a strong earthquake at the end time, and the island, they will be moved away. It shows us the picture of Indonesian tsunami how it impacted the surrounding countries. Earthquakes and also pestilences, disease, epidemic disease.
people's hearts are getting dull because these kind, of, these kind of things are happening again and again. But this is very serious. In Luke's gospel, chapter 21, verse 25, Jesus said, And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's heart failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. For the power of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, coming in a cloud with power and great glory, which means that Jesus' coming will be happening very soon. Now, when these things begin to happen, when these things begin to happen, all these disasters, natural disasters, earthquakes, famine, pestilences, look up and lift up your head because your redemption draws near. We need to be warned. Be awake. This interesting picture shows us the millions of toad in China just before the strong earthquake in Sichuan, China, a couple of years ago. Millions of toad, they felt the sense of earthquake movement from the ground, and then they were fleeing away to the mountain. Very interesting picture. About three days before the earthquake came, these millions of toad, they were fleeing away up to the mountain. But people, they were not aware of that. And they were hit by the, by the earthquake. And when I see that, it reminds me the image of what is going on today. In some sense, the animals, they are smarter than us. Right? People, they are sleeping. They are dull because they are spiritually sleeping. We need to understand what is going on right now. Then all these things around us, all things are happening around us, they are giving us a wake-up call, alarming clock. This is the picture of Nepal earthquake a couple of days ago. In Isaiah chapter 24, verse 19 and 20 reads, The earth is violently broken. The earth is split open. The earth is shaken exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard and shall totter like a hut. Its transgression shall be heavy upon it, and it will fall and not rise again. According to the scripture, the earthquake movement it, it is the common way of God's judgment against the sin of people. What is the reason that the earthquake movement are becoming frequent and, and very common and very stronger? Because the sin of man is becoming higher and higher, stronger and stronger. Epidemic disease, pestilence. Let's listen to our goal. There are cities that were founded because they were just above the mosquito line. Nairobi is one. Harare is another. There are plenty of others. Now the mosquitoes with warming are climbing to higher altitudes. There are a lot of vectors for infectious diseases that are worrisome to us that are also expanding their range. Not only mosquitoes, but all of these others as well. And we've had 30 so-called new diseases that have emerged just uh, in the last quarter century. New well, disease. One thing, we're coming to the end of near. There are cities that were founded because they were just above the mosquito line. Nairobi is one. Harare is another. There are plenty of others. Now the mosquitoes with warming are climbing to higher altitudes. There are a lot of vectors for infectious diseases that are worrisome to us that are also expanding their range, not only mosquitoes, but all of these others as well. And we've had 30 so-called 
new diseases that have emerged just uh, in the last quarter century. And a lot of them, like SARS, have caused tremendous problems, the resistant uh, forms of tuberculosis. There are others. And there's been a reemergence of some diseases that were once under control. The avian flu, of course, quite a serious matter, as you know. West Nile virus, it came to the eastern shore of Maryland in 1999. Two years later, it was across the Mississippi. And two years after that, it had spread across the continent. But these are uh, very troubling signs. Coral reefs all over the world, because of global warming and other factors, are bleaching, and they end up like this. And all the fish species that depend on the coral reefs are also in jeopardy as a result. Overall, species loss is now occurring at a rate 1,000 times greater than the natural background. Well, for one thing, we're coming to the end of nearly 6,000 years of Earth's probation, according to the Bible. But more importantly, the prophets of both the Old and the New Testament have given us specific signs to look for, events that will occur in the last days. Some 2,500 years ago, the prophet Ezekiel, speaking for God, said, O my people, I will open up your graves and bring you up from them and bring you back to the land of Israel. He went on to say, I will take the children of Israel out of the nations where they have gone. I will gather them from all around and bring them back into their own land. And then he concluded, I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel, and there will be one king over them. This is one of the most remarkable specific prophecies of all. Many of us have lived to see it happen. Now, in the context, the announcement of the opening of the graves refers to the national restoration of Israel. And on May 14, 1948, just 50 years ago, the Jews became a nation on their own. I believe the prophecy of Ezekiel is being fulfilled to the letter. Secondly, Jesus Christ predicted there would be a dramatic increase in the number of earthquakes worldwide in the last days prior to his return. Now, in the first decade of this 20th century, there were three major earthquakes of a 6.0 or greater magnitude. Since that time, there's been a steady increase, especially in the last 20 years. For example, from 1980 to 1990, there were 310 major earthquakes. From 1990 to 1994, there were an astonishing 747 6.0 or greater magnitude earthquakes around the world. happening right now. They are giving us an alarm clock. Very clear. Today we are living at the end time. Then Jesus is coming soon in our generation. Some of us here will receive the coming of Jesus Christ. And some of us may die before Jesus comes. Okay? And finally, one more sign in Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. Let me remind you what Jesus said. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nation. And then the end will come. Worldwide evangelism. That is also one of the very important signs of the end time. Before the end time come, the gospel will be preached, which means that the opportunity of salvation will be given to all nations. Today, the Holy Bible has been translated into more than 2,000 languages. Even today, weekly Bible translators, they are working so hard to translate our English Bible into the primitive languages. They, uh, they have done a pretty good job. And Indios in Amazon jungle, they are listening to Christian radio. And some of them, they are reading the Bible through online. Even in Amazon, Manaus, Brazil, pretty uh, modernized capital city of the Amazon jungle. People, they are reading online Bible. In a small town of Africa, Western missionaries, they are preaching the gospel to the African people. Everywhere, Eskimo Indians, 
Russian Siberian Indian and South American Indios on high mountains. Yes, the gospel has been preached into all nations. Today, we are living a new, new age of technology, internet. It has become a great tool for evangelism. Yes, this is God is doing. And it is very, very clear that we are living at the end time. This is what God has told, and this is what we have seen. This is what we have heard. And how can we deny? We know from the Bible that God has his own dispensation. He has his own program throughout the history. From the beginning to the end. From the time of Adam to Abraham, it is called the time of conscience. From Abraham or from Moses to the first coming of Jesus, this period is being called as the time of the law. And now we are living in the time of grace or the time of Gentile. The gospel has been preached into all nations. Since the crucifixion of Jesus. Jesus died on the cross. And he rose again on the third. And the gospel has been preached. Throughout the world. Until today. We are living at the end time. Which means. That we are living. At the end time of grace. This is the time. That the grace of salvation. Is given to all men. But someday. The time of of grace will be terminated when Jesus comes again in the air. This is also called as the time of the Gentiles because the gospel has been preached to, into all Gentile nations and many, many Gentile people, they received the gospel and they became born again Christian. But a lot of Jews today, they are still rejecting the gospel of Christ. Many of them, they believe in God, but they don't believe in Jesus. They believe in God's creation, but they don't, they don't believe in the cross of Jesus. They believe in the Old Testament Bible, but they don't believe in the New Testament Bible. This is the Judaism. They are still waiting for their Messiah. The Messiah who will comfort them and then make their nation great. And recover their glory as in former time. They are still waiting for the Messiah. Even though the Messiah already came 2,000 years ago. Anyway, the time of grace or the time of the Gentile, the opportunity that has been given to us for the salvation of our soul will be done someday. Then... Jesus will come again in the air. Right at the time, there will be a rapture of the Christians. Rapture, which means that the Christians will be snatched away into heaven. When Jesus comes again, he is going to take us into heaven. Rapture, which means take away. Jesus said one day, Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two men will be sleeping in the bed. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. The earth is round. So some people, at the time of rapture, the rapture will take place instantly in a twinkle of an eye. The people, some people, they will be taken away into sky during the daytime while they are walking in the field. Some people, they will be taken into sky while they are sleeping in the night. Some people, they will be grinding at the mill, preparing the meal time, and they will be taken into sky. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we 
who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the cloud to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with his words. The dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together. The dead in Christ, the people who, who heard the gospel and who received the gospel into their heart, and the people who became born-again Christian, they are already dead, many of them, for the last 2,000 years. They are the dead in Christ. The true born-again believer, they are being called as the one who is in Christ. If someone does not believe Jesus, he is out of Christ. Suppose that there will be a thunderstorm, lightning, and heavy rain out there. And if you go out, no protection. But if you're inside this house, you will be protected. Likewise, if you believe Jesus as your personal savior, you will receive salvation of Christ. You are in Christ. But if you, be, if you do not believe Jesus and what he has done for you, you are not in Christ. You are outside of Christ. No protection. That's what it means. The dead in Christ, born again Christian, who died already, they will rise first. And then we, if the rapture took place tonight, right now, we who are remain alive, we will follow them. The dead in Christ will rise first, and then we will follow them right away. We will be taken into the sky and stay in the sky seven years, and then we'll come down to the ground, to the earth, seven years later. During that time, between the first coming in the air and the coming to the earth, there will be seven-year tribulation time. And we are going to learn what will be happening during this time. Then Jesus will come to the earth, and he is going to set up millennial kingdom, 1,000-year kingdom on the earth. Then there will be eternal heaven and eternal hellfire. And this is the timeline of God's program, the dispensation of God. Rapture. When Jesus comes again in the air, we will be translated into heaven. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall all not, not sleep. We shall all not sleep. But we shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible. And we shall be changed. The rapture, it brings the change of the body. This corruptible body will become incorruptible body. This weak and fragile body will put on strong and beautiful and perfect body. Will become like Jesus. Jesus died on the cross and rose again on the third, on the third day. And he appeared to his disciple after his resurrection. And he showed his body to the disciples of Jesus. And we will become like Jesus, exactly like him. We will put on new body of resurrection. So if you believe that you are an ugly person, don't worry. You will be changed. You will become like Miss Universe or handsome movie star, whatever. You have any disability, any problem in your body? Don't worry. Your body will be changed into beautiful body, new body. Genesis chapter 5, verse 24, shows us the image of one person who was raptured before the flood of Noah. His name was Enoch. Enoch, he walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. He became a foreshadowing of the rapture of the born-again Christian. 
He was walking with God, and one day God took him, and he was not. He was, he was translated into heaven without experiencing the physical death. And this is what is going to happen at the time of rapture. Where are they right now? School classroom? Movie theater? I don't think so. In church sanctuary. If you are not born again, this is what will be happening dreadfully to you. Therefore, you must be ready. Someone might say, I go to church every Sunday. I was born and I, I grew up in a Christian family. I'm pretty good. I'm trying to be a good person. But that does not necessarily mean that you will be raptured on that day. What you are doing right now does not guarantee your salvation. What you are doing, what you have done, do not guarantee the rapture of you. But what you believe, it will guarantee your rapture. So the most important thing is not what you are doing, what you did before, what you will do in the later, but what you believe. That is the key point. The Bible tells us that we are saved by faith. Not by doing something, not by works, but by faith alone. Are you in Christ or out of Christ? That's the key point. True born again Christian, they will be snatched away into heaven, but non believers and unsaved, unborn again people, they will be left behind. The day is coming soon and very soon. Then there will be seven year tribulation time. During this time, there are two major things. Number one, the man named Antichrist will appear, and he's going to become a dictator of the world. He will become a worldwide dictator, and then he is going to govern over all people in the world. His name is Antichrist. He's going to put marks on the forehead and on the right hand of all people. And then without the number of beast, people cannot buy or sell. Let's go to uh, Revelation chapter 13. Book of Revelation. Chapter 13. There are many things that we need to learn, but because time is limited, let me give you just the outline of the major thing that will take place during the tribulation time. Chapter 13, verse 16 through 18. Remember that this prophecy of John, book of Revelation, was written 1,900 years ago from today. When he was in the island of Patmos in the Mediterranean Sea. Verse 16. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. And that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding... Calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. This is what John saw 1,900 years ago. God showed a revelation to, to John, John the Apostle, and he saw the vision, and then he recorded in the book of Revelation. This is what he saw. One man named Antichrist will come. And then he's going to put his mark, his number, on the body of all people in the world. 
on their forehead and on their right hand. Without it, people could not buy or sell. Interesting. What does it mean? This kind of passage, it was very, very difficult passage 50 to 70 years ago or 100 years ago. One of the most difficult passages in the Bible because people at the time, they could not clearly understand what it really meant. Right? People will receive the mark on their forehead and on their right hand, and they cannot buy or sell except this number. Very hard to understand. But today, we can easily understand the meaning of this passage because we are living in a computer society. And the society that we are using different type of currency. Can we put marks on our body and use it for buying or selling something? Absolutely, yes. Let me give you some more detailed information about Antichrist. Antichrist, he is not the Christ, but he claims to be Christ. He is false Christ. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, gives us an information, information about him. Antichrist, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he, Antichrist, sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. He is not God, but he sits as God, he claims to be God, even though he is not a true God. And interestingly, the Bible tells us that he is going to sit in the temple of God. Very interesting prophecy. But if you go to Israel today, you may visit this place, the Temple Mount. This was the site of Solomonic Temple. King Solomon, he built his temple upon this site. Then there was Zerubbabel Temple and the Temple of King Herod. The King Herod, he remodeled the Temple of the Old Temple at the time of Jesus. But when the Roman Empire defeated Israel and destroyed the city of Israel, then they burned the temple and then they totally destroyed the temple. It was the temple site but the temple was gone, totally gone. And only the retaining war is remained. This was not the war of the temple. Remember that all the stones in the temple was going to be crumbled. These are not the walls of the temple. It was the retaining war of the temple mount. And there... Muslim people, they built their own temple. Then, here's the question. The Bible tells us that the Antichrist, he is going to sit in the temple of God when he comes in the end time. Then, logically, the Jewish temple must be built again in order that the Antichrist may sit on it. Absolutely, yes. Here is Temple Mount. This Muslim temple may be destroyed by bomb. Somebody may bomb on it. Or strong earthquake movement will take place. We don't know exactly. They can destroy this temple or they can choose another site, the neighboring site, to build the Jewish temple. Anyway, the big problem is this. So many Jews of today, they want to build their own temple on this site. If you go inside the temple, there is a huge rock. This is, this is known as the site of Mount Moriah, where Abraham tried to offer his son Isaac to God. 
Mount Moriah, divine place. That was the reason why King Solomon, he built this temple upon this rock. But the temple, the Jewish temple was destroyed, and Muslim temple is there. This is what we know, but a lot of Muslim people, they believe that Muhammad, he ascended into heaven from that rock, whatever they believe. So this is a very sacred place to the Muslim people and also very sacred place to the Jewish people. And Israeli people today, they want to build a new temple on this mountain. And this is the reason why they are praying for the day that they can build the temple. The plan of new temple is already done. Long time ago, in 1997, former Palestinian, the Palestinian PLO leader, Yasser Arafat, he had a press conference, and he said, our Muslim people, we are against the Israeli government and their plan to build a new temple. This is what he said in his press conference. He knew what was going on. Yes, this is what is going on today. We're supposed to build a temple, and nothing about that changed. Nothing about that commandment changed. God gave me such an important part in this time. Go to my people Israel and say to them to build my temple, my house. by peace, the third temple is taking shape. We began with the fifth. Then the instrument. Then the fifth. We're working on the blueprint. And this menorah is a $3 million menorah. It's made of 42 kilos of pure 24 karat gold. And a new generation of Levite priests, specially trained for temple service. Step by step, by building the vessel. In the near future, these two cornerstones will start the process of the rebuilding of the third temple. These two stones will be the cornerstones for the third temple on Mount Moriah, in the same location of the first and the second temple. In the <laughs> 그 옛날 솔로몬의 성전이 있던 자리, 그리고 수르바벨의 제2 성전이 있던 바로 그 자리. And they build the new temple. The Bible says, yes, they will. But it sounds very impossible because Jews in Israel and Palestine people, they are fighting each other every day. How can they build a new temple? If they start to build a new temple, then the war will break out. Sounds very impossible. But the Bible tells us that the Antichrist, he's going to bring seven-year peace agreement in the Middle East region by bringing two people into one table. Daniel chapter 9, verse 27 states that the Antichrist will come and he's going to make a covenant of exactly seven years. Daniel 9, chapter 20, uh, verse 27. He's going to bring a peace agreement with many people and this is what it can be very possible. Jewish people today, they want to build their own temple, new temple. But the Palestine people in Israel, they want to have their own land. But many Jews of today, they did not want it. They did not want Palestinian people to occupy the part of their land. 
That was the main problem. So Israeli people and Palestine people, they fought each other every day. Suicide bombing. And we have heard about it so many times. But if the agreement happened, this is a possible scenario. The party of the government Israel and the party of Palestine government gather together somewhere at White House or in Europe, in Paris, and the Antichrist, he's going to bring two parties into one table, and then they will make an agreement. Israeli people, they will receive the Temple Mount, and Palestine people, they will give the Temple Mount to the Israeli people so that Israeli people could build their new temple. By exchange with that, Israeli government, they will decide to give some part of the land of Israel to the Palestine people. Then they will draw a new map. Here is Israel, and here is Palestine country. Then we must change the world map. But Israeli people, they will be in great shout and joy because they are ready to build a new temple. This is a very possible scenario. The Bible tells us that the Antichrist will sit in the new temple, which logically means that the temple must be rebuilt before Antichrist may sit on the new temple. Yes, we have just heard that so many Jews in Israel today, they have already made blueprints, they have made utensils that they are going to use in the new temple, and they are training Levites, the Levite children, the students, and they are training them. Very, very close, very, very soon, the new temple plan will be revealed. But if you heard the news from CNN or Fox News that Israel and Palestinian people, they came to an agreement and they are to build a new temple, then what does it mean? Jesus, he truly comes. He is coming soon and very soon. Antichrist, he is going to put marks on their forehead and on the right hand of the people, not left hand, on the right hand. Today, we are using barcode system everywhere. Computer number, the number that are read by computer. We don't know how, we don't know exactly how people design this barcode system, but it is known that they are using number 666. Six, six. On the left, on the right, and in the middle. This is number six that computer read. Be like a number. There was this, clima, uh, this type of traffic signal somewhere in Bay Area in California, San Francisco area. And we don't know what happened to it later. But anyway, what does it mean? Weird design. Be like a number. Then we see some head with ears and number. Look who's behind our bars. This man's name is Tom Janning, and he's one of the many backward experts. And he and his company invented a system that they, that they can build the backward number on the forehead. Wow. This German magazine cover page, Schutterum which means star in German, it shows us the image of people who have mark, backward number on their forehead. I'm Fox Comp in the computer. Fox, count by computer. You will have backward chip someday. Yes. 
it will happen very soon. People believe we are now living in what the Bible calls the end times, a period of great social upheaval and natural disasters. The list includes earthquake, fire, pestilence, wars, and rumors of wars. Modern science seems to confirm the possibility that the ancient warnings regarding natural disasters could indeed materialize. So what exactly are the other signs we have to look forward to if we are in fact in the last days? Let's turn to the book of Revelations. In chapter 13, beginning with verse 16, John speaks of the great beast that will have all power in the last days. He also forced everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on his right hand or on his forehead, so that no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of his name. This calls for wisdom. If anyone has insight, let him calculate the number of the beast, for it is a man's number. His number is 666. What John seems to be describing in considerable detail is a cashless society. Is that a possibility in our lifetime? Credit cards are marvelous things. These little pieces of plastic make it unnecessary to pack large sums of cash or write out dozens of checks. Just swipe it through the card reader and instantly your bill is paid. Just a generation ago, a personal identification number on a global basis seemed like an inconceivable idea. And yet today, it is not only possible, but it is very near to becoming a stark reality. We're all familiar with the barcode system for checkout. It's currently in use in practically every retail outlet in our country, as well as most of the technologically advanced countries around the world. But does a technology exist that would make it possible to simply pass the laser reader across the back of your hand? or forehead. And what would the laser be reading? Different translations of the Bible disagree, by the way. Some say the mark will be on the hand, others say in the hand or forehead. The technology not only exists, but it has been tested extensively and successfully. I personally have seen one of these implantable devices. It's a small device about the size of a grain of rice. Interestingly enough, in certain subjects, it had to be removed because it caused a reaction similar to boils. This has some very interesting biblical implications. There are a number of groups that are promoting the advantages of a cashless society. And the steps between a credit card or debit card and having a mark on your hand or forehead are few indeed. There are very few in order to buy or sell, especially under pain of death, that would resist receiving such a mark. The fact is, we're a lot closer to being there than most people want to believe. The vast majority, probably upwards of 85% of all transactions, are already cashless transactions. To take it a step further, if all of us were to demand cash instead of journal entries of one kind or another, there'd only be enough cash in existence to cover 5% of the transactions. We are seeing the fulfillment of the biblical prophecies. It is very, very clear that we are living at the end time. Now at this time, what kind of attitude we should have? We must be warned and we must be ready. Are you ready? Are you truly ready in your heart? If Jesus comes tonight, are you ready to receive him? How can you receive him? And how do you know that you will receive him? What is the evidence or witness in your heart that you will receive him without fear. You must become a born-again Christian. If you are not, this is the time that you are, you are preparing for that moment. Romans chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. This is the final passage of today. I'm going to read this passage and then get dismissed. Romans chapter 2, verse 4. And five. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? But in accordance with your hardness and your imp imp impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath 
in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. The meaning is very simple. People, they hear the gospel, but some of them, they don't, they don't believe it. When they do not believe in the gospel, with their hardness, they are treasuring up the wrath of God that will be poured upon them. Why do people perish? Why do people go to hell fire? Even though God has given all the answers through the Bible, he has given many, many evidences. He has given infallible proofs and evidences. But why so many people don't believe it? Why do they go to hell? And why do they choose to go to hell fire? Because of hardness in their heart, stubbornness in their heart. That is the main problem. So we must become like children. Unless you become like children, you may not enter into the kingdom of God. Let us humble our heart and let's try our best to have childlike attitude and understand how weak we are how sinful we are, and how bad we are. Jesus is coming soon and very soon. We must be ready. From tomorrow, and I'm going to, I'm going to speak about the way of salvation. How can we get saved? What is the way of salvation? And how can I make sure of my salvation? How can I get the assurance? Very important lesson. Tomorrow, Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday morning. Three more classes. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time. And I pray to you at this moment that you may remember all of us and each one of us in this room. That you may give us a humble heart. That we may become like children. And come to you like children. And ask you the salvation of Christ. Please remember all of us and each person of us so that no one will be, will be lost, but all come to repentance and to the knowledge of salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.